Um, my name is Jasmine, and I'm one of the many event coordinators here at LCS. And I'm very excited to introduce day two of Career Month to you in partnership with Laurier's Personal Finance Club. As many of you may already know, LCS is dedicated to delivering events to all comp sci students to help you build the skill to succeed both in school and after graduating. Um, the events team has been working very hard um, to plan an amazing career month for you all. Um, day three of career month is on Wednesday and we'll be presenting a LinkedIn Learn a Tool series event. We will then end career month with networking with professionals on Friday the 25th. Um, during this event, students will get the opportunity to network in person with a handful of professionals in the field. So make sure you keep up with the LCS Instagram for any updates and event details. Tonight, we have a special guest joining us in collaboration with Laurier's PFC Club. Um, John is a Waterloo graduate who is currently working as a software development engineer at Bungalow. Um, John will be introducing resources and providing tips and advice on how to perform well on your technical interviews. So without further ado, I would like to pass it on to John to introduce himself. Hey guys. Um, hi, so my name is John. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so I'll do a little introduction about myself. I graduated from University of Waterloo 2017, and then I joined a company called um, Chisel AI. I uh, worked as a backend engineer there. And then um, after working there uh, three to four years, I joined a company called Bungalow, uh, Bungalow where I currently work. Um, again, I'm a backend engineer there. Um, at Chisel, I had sort of a mixed responsibilities. I started off as a backend and then um, transition towards um, data engineering and a bit of DevOps skills. Um, speaking of that, um, a great thing about working at a startup is that you get a breadth of knowledge. Whereas if you join a big company or a very late stage startup, um, your role may be sort of pigeonholed into like just doing back end, um, in my example anyway. So yeah, um, that's a little intro about myself. Um, I'd like to ask you guys a question. So how many of you actually enjoy doing interviews? Raise a hand or something um, in the chat. I guess like not a lot of people uh, really enjoy doing interviews. And like that was my experience as well. Like when I get an interview as a co-op student, like my heart is pounding, my legs weak. Um, but after doing hundreds of interviews and applying for thousands of jobs, I had enough failures to actually kind of start enjoying it. And interviews, are, so people enjoy talking about themselves, right? It's an opportunity for you to talk about your interest as well as knowing, um, learning about theirs, like the interviewers, and talk about um, like interesting projects that they worked on, um, as well as like interesting projects that you worked on. and. Yeah, there are tons of ways to like have fun in an interview. And one time I had an interview where like everything went really well in a one hour interview and we finished everything in within like the 40 minutes. And then last 20 minutes, we just talked about like, what's your favorite ice cream and just got into um, just personal stuffs and um, interests, hobbies and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's it. And I think we are ready to dive in. Um, one second. That's my dog Jojo. Um, so yeah, here's the agenda. Um, so we're gonna. I would like to present um, this meeting, sort of um, in a synchronous way. Um, in the same way how you like do your interview. So um, in the beginning, you, you talk to the recruiter and then what well, the very first step is, you know, submitting your application and then um, they're going to look at your resume, which is um, it's basically like the Tinder pro profile of, of, um, of yourself because it's the first thing they're going to see and it leaves the first impression. And then we're going to talk about interviews. Um, different stages of interviews, the first recruiter call all the way to um, for our in-person um, interview, the final stage. And then we're going to uh, talk about employers. 
um, as much as um, as much as the interview is about um, companies looking for um, looking to hire the best candidate. It's also about you trying to find a company that you want to work for. And there's not many things worse than working for a company. You're dreading to um, show up at work in the morning. And yeah, that's just, it's terrible experience. Like um, your manager yelling at people. Um, and then, yeah, everything goes well. And then you, uh, you receive an offer. I suggest um, you try to negotiate, even if you don't have a competing offer. Um, because throughout your professional career, you're going to have to negotiate all the time. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about how you negotiate your offer, um, not just um, in terms of salary, but in terms of like benefits, time off, vacation. And lastly, what do you do when you get rejected? Like, how do you cope with the feeling of rejection and all the negative feelings that come with sort of just failure, right? It's, um, I had to deal with that all the time. And yeah, have fun, good, uh, good luck. So interviews and challenges of hiring. Um, so it's important to look at interviews from the interviewer's perspective. Um, if you understand what they're looking for also, it. Obviously, it's it's easier to frame your um, answers in a way that meets their expectation or um, yeah meets their expectation. So um, three things. Obviously, your skills are very important. Um, and when I talk about skills, um, it 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 meet you have to meet the um, level of aptitude for the position. Um, meaning, if you're a co-op student, they will expect level of understanding that that meets the level um, of like a first or second year student. But when you join, you know, when you're applying for um, first full time job, they're going to expect someone who has, you know, basic knowledge of like um, object oriented programming um, and can solve some um, easy to medium level Likud questions. I would say mostly easy. Um, and then once you are in my position, so I'm in sort of like intermediate to senior, had you know roughly four to five level, uh, four to five years experience. Um, they're going to look for ability to collaborate in a team, ability to coach and and um, sort of take leadership role in, in small projects. Um, yeah, and and tech stack and languages are obviously important, but. There, there, it's not, um, if, if you don't know a certain tech stack that the company uses, it's not the end of the day. So for example, um, if you are a front end developer and you know React and the company uses some other um, different front end framework, um, they don't really care too much about like a certain libraries or frameworks. So for example, I interviewed with DoorDash um, and I asked them like, what's the tech stack that you use for backend? Because I'm mainly a Python developer and they mentioned that um, they use Kotlin and the Kotlin is a language pretty similar to Java. Um, and they told me like, look, it's okay. If, if you don't know Kotlin, we will actually coach you. Yeah, um, the collaboration. So the higher you go in, um, the higher you go in your role, so from, from junior to all the way to the senior level and the management, um, your ability to collaborate becomes more important because now you're dealing with different um, stakeholders. You're going to have to talk to clients. You're going to have to talk to different um, managers and different teams, um, director level. Um, and for co-ops and um, for people applying for their first full-time position, they're looking for mainly your ability to um, take hints well, um, ability to take feedback well, and um, the po um, sorry, positive attitude. So when you, um, for your first job in like co-ops inter like co and internships, obviously you're not gonna have all the knowledge and understanding of a senior developer. And 
because of that, they're going to, they will specifically look for your ability to just accept hints and take guidance very well um, and open to criticism. And it's important to take criticism in an impersonal way. Um, so basically, you know, don't be butthurt when someone tells you, look, um, you made a mistake here. Um, like, can you improve on it? Um, you know, you're not very detail oriented. Here are some ways to like improve on it. And you might not agree with it, but just don't be but hurt and, and try to um, see it from their perspective when you're making mistakes or when they comment um, on your mistakes. Okay, so lastly, culture fit. Good companies put really high emphasis on this. Um, Amazon, for example, they, they would rather let um, good hires go if that meant that they're not hiring a bad, um, an employee that would be a bad influence to the team. Like a one bad um, team member or, or one employee that, um, one bad apple to the team brings the whole morale down. And um, they really put high emphasis on just trying to avoid that. Um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So yeah, resumes, this is the first thing that they're going to see um, about you and they're going to uh, make the first, first their um, interviews will make their first impression by looking at your resume. Um, this was my biggest challenge too, as a co-op student, because I would apply to like 100 or 150 jobs per co-op term and I would get maybe five interviews. Um, and that's because I had bad resumes, not because not necessarily because I didn't have good experience because when you're a first year student, all of your, um, all of your experience sort, it's sort of the same. And unless like you did, you know, in high school, like you've, you've worked for a startup or something, which is very rare. Um, so some of the principles about resumes, like the same principles, um, that make any communication, um, the same principles that make an, any communication um, useful and, and um, understandable to the listeners apply the same way to resumes as well. So um, keep your resumes just very, avoid verbosity at any cost and try to be concise and precise at the same time. Meaning you mean what you're trying to say in the short enough, shortest number of words, um, but be precise. Um, that way your resume is easy to read and there's a certain flow to it and you know resumes are not essays and try to avoid redundancy like i said about um verbosity um and don't ever bullshit on your resume i'm going to talk about that um kiss principle keep it simple stupid uh, yeah just try to make your resume as simple as possible because they're going to be so the people who will look at your resume will have different understanding. So the recruiter that looks at your, at your resume might not have the technical background of an engineer. And if you mention some of the, like the libraries or, or, um, or frameworks that is not, it's not very commonly used, um, then like a recruiter might not know, um, what it is or Yeah, I think that's enough about the KISS principle. So like, let's look at some of the examples. Oh, um, I want to show uh, my friend's resume that I think is, um, it's a, this is a great resume. Um, and the reason why I think this is a great resume is because it's, it's, it's just a list of experiences. So the employment, there's only employment section and education section. Like he doesn't have, um, it's very simple to read. Um, so one thing I'd like to talk about is that contrary to like the common belief, I don't think you should use, um, you should use numbers on a resume. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that um, following this slide, but um, yeah, this is just very simple to read. Each bullet point is just between like 10 to 20 words. Um, and he, is able, he's able to explain what he did um, without using any flowery words. Um, yeah, in a single page. 
So yeah, I copied some of the um, bullet points from uh, resumes that were submitted to me. And so the, um, these are examples of some of the stuff that I read off your resume. So, okay, let's look at the first example. Um, worked on STS. I have no idea what STS means. And I Googled this and it's not, it's a company specific term. So it's not really an industry term. Um, so this person used six words to say which team he was in. STS systems, tools and software team. Um, and it sounds like this, uh, whatever team that he was on is a subset of backend. And that's all you need to say. Like I worked in a backend team and yeah, so personally, this is another word that I don't like. Um, this is what I call a floating, um, floating adjective or floating um, adverb. Those are like terms or, or words that don't really add much to the value, uh, add much value to the um, resume. So if you remove this word personally, right, are you losing any value or um, would it mean any, anything differently? It's like saying, okay, um, I personally went to McDonald's. Like you don't need to use the word personally. It, it means the same thing. So I would rewrite this bullet point to um, something like this. So ensured availability of backend services using XYZ um, technologies. Because you know, this is back, it means essentially backend. Um, Tools and stack, this is another um, example of verbosity or repetitiveness. So tools and stack, you can just reduce it down to like tools. Um, and um, availability is actually the word that I would use. So this person built internal tools that needs to be kept available at all times. And, and availability is actually a term um, commonly used in the, in the industry. So I would just um, replace this whole thing and say, um, I ensure the availability of internal services and of some of these technologies in there. And the, some of the things um, he used here, it doesn't really make much sense. So, so Stack were active and online daily. You do not, so Jira, is an external service that um, allow users to share tickets, um, tasks. You don't ensure that Jira is up. It's a, it's a, that's the work of Jira engineers. And same thing for Azure DevOps. Like the way this is worded, it sounds like the person um, worked to keep DevOps, Azure DevOps services active. Like again, that's, that's the Azure DevOps engineer's job. Like what this person is intending to say, I think, is he kept um, the services that were deployed to Azure DevOps um, available. So yeah, let's go to the second bullet point. I would, okay, so collaborate and communicate. You guys read this and I would reward this bullet point to collaborated with team members to develop a web application. So collaborate and communicate. This is repetitive. Why? Because when you collaborate, the fact that you communicate is already implied. Like how can you collaborate without working with other people, without communicating, to brainstorm and create solutions-based web application. So when I read this, I ask myself, like what is a solutions-based web application? just say web app, right? You work to create, you work with your team to create a web application. Um, again, like that provides value to users, what kind of value and what to what users and what those solutions based so, um, web application mean. If you're unable to explain this in like one or two um, words, then just say web application and the really the time to explain the specific details of your um, task and responsibility that comes during an interview. So during the second or third stage um, engineer will go um, deep dive into specific responsibilities you had 
And that's your opportunity to really talk about um, the things you did and how it impacted um, the overall, how it added value to the team. Uh, third bullet point, interpreted customer operations data. So what is customer operations data? What kind of data did you interpret, right? This could be financial data from the customer, or it could be um, some kind of cancer research data. Like this could be anything. So this is not specific enough to really understand what this person did. Develop eight KPIs. Like, what does KPI mean? I have to Google this. Um, and the fact that like he, this guy worked on this person worked on eight KPIs. Like, the number eight again, like it doesn't matter, right? He could have written ten KPI. Like, there's no way for me to know. And like, it just doesn't really add much value to measure company-wide performance. <clears throat> again, like this lacks um, specificity. So what kind of performance? Um, that's the question that I ask myself when I read that. Showcasing six insights to CEO. I When I read the word showcasing, it sounds like, um, I don't know, this, this makes the sound, person sound like a superstar. Um, I would avoid words like that. Six insights to CEO. Again, the number six doesn't matter. It could be 10. Wouldn't mean anything different. Um, it wouldn't mean anything differently. Um, insights to CEO. Again, like if this company is a really small startup with 10 people, it makes sense that this person work, um, you know, showcase those insights to the CEO. But otherwise, like if it's a medium sized um, company with like 100 employees, the intern went to talk to CEO or even like a larger company, right? If this is a bank and I personally talk to CEO and then I'm an intern, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, findings relocated $20,000. I wouldn't use that again. Um, operational issues, what kind of operational issues, right? You have to be specific. So I actually want to um, talk about an example. So back when I was in Waterloo, um, and I think this wasn't um, 30 or, or something like that. Um, we had a guy who interned at Facebook and after he returned, you know, in class, he started talking about, Oh, like Facebook was so great. And, and one of the things that he was so proud of was that he shook, um, he shook hands with Mark Zuckerberg. And I think that's the most important thing that happened in his 20 year life because he would, he would talk about it so often. And I think that kind of lines back to like, oh, like I spoke to CEO. It, it just doesn't really leave good impression, I think. Um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So interview process. So this is obviously different from like what a co-op student might expect, but um, at the end of the day, you're gonna have so for co-op student, like you might have one or two steps from this, or you might do um, application, phone screen, and then like um, in-person assessment with an engineer, but it will always be either a short form of this or a mixture of this. So if you're interviewing with like, for example, a fan companies or other like household names, Uber, Lyft and companies like that, you're gonna have a, obviously go through the application process uh, more often, a recruiter from them will reach out to you. Um, so make sure you have a good LinkedIn page or have LinkedIn page at all. Um, and then you're going to have a phone screen with a recruiter. Um, you're just trying to make sure that you just have the basic knowledge and, and um, it is able to do go through like the online assessment. Um, so one thing I'm going to talk about here is one of the important metrics, um, one of the important um, metrics that um, that a recruiter a recruiter is judged on is how many um, so percentage wise, like how many candidates are able to pass the entire um, interview process. So how many people that you recommend to the hiring manager is able to complete like all the way to the end. Um, so say, you know, a, a, a recruiter 
um, passes uh, 100 resumes to the um, employing hiring manager, and none of the none of those people actually make to the end after going, um, you know, doing an online assessment, the technical round, and all that, because. There are going to be um, engineers and, and managers that will be involved um, to go through like the four hour final round or even the technical round. So it costs a lot of money to, to follow through the entire um, interview process. So for example, like an interview with Amazon or Uber, um, my, my experience with Amazon um, application process was that after the phone screen, there is an online assessment um, and it's pretty, um, they try to test you based on like a, a very wide breadth of knowledge. So not only there are some coding problems, um, there are questions um, designed to test, uh, designed to test like your behavior um, and personality, like there's some personality tests um, also design problems. So they're going to ask you like how to design, um, a simple backend service with, with, um, with the database backend. Um, and then one hour technical round. Um, so this is going to be an interview, uh, with one engineer, um, from the team that you're applying for. Um, and they're going to do a deep dive into your resume. So this is exactly why. I tell you, don't bullshit on your resumes because the interviewers will, they will try to pry and they will try to pry and get as much information as possible from, um, from what you're on your resume. So you, if you say, um, um, let me think. So if you bullshit on your resume and like, you actually don't know how to answer some of the most basic questions, then you know, the, the interview is pretty much over at that point. And the rest of one hour is just going to be like, you're going to do a coding challenge, but they're not going to go through to the next round. Um, he's just what um, sitting there watching. So it's a waste of time for them, a waste of time for you. So don't bullshit on your resume. I think there is one gray area. If you put something on your resume and spend a lot of time actually being familiar with the content and, and um, if you can meet the technical aptitude to be able to answer some of those, uh, most of the questions, then I think you spend enough time that essentially it has become true. Like your bullshit is no longer bullshit anymore. It's kind of true. Like you can, you can work on these tasks because you, you studied and you spend a lot of time doing it. Um, and the final four hour stage, um, this is the scary part. Um, so it usually consists of a um, couple of coding rounds and the design round um, and the design round is it's a very complex and open-ended questions like um, design Facebook and scale it from um, thousand users all the way to a billion like how do you, um, and they're gonna see how you're able to ask the right questions and ability to take hints and um, your knowledge of different components of system design. So for example, like caching, load balancers, um, how do you avoid like single point failures for like first or second year students for co-op students, like I don't expect you to know it, or actually I don't know, I don't expect anybody, anybody here to answer those questions very well because, um, you know, it might, it's probably going to be your first full-time positions. Um, but for, in my case, my very first job, um, my work at Chisel, they did ask me some design problems, which I absolutely bombed on. But um, what they're looking for, if, if they do ask you those questions for your first uh, full-time job, like they're mainly looking for your attitude and they're going to try to guide you through the right answers. Um, so instead of just being really nervous and give up, like try to take hints and kind of let them explain um, their thought process and, and try to just follow through. And obviously after that, if you did everything right, it's gonna to lead to an offer. So behavioral questions. My experience is that more competitive 
the, comp the company is. Um, and better companies really put high emphasis on the behavioral questions. So for example, Amazon puts about 50% um, importance on how you answer the technical questions, but also 50% on like um, the behavioral part of um, candidates. So, you know, some of the more common question is like, what is your big, biggest weakness? Um, tell me about a time you had a conflict with your coworker. Questions like these may be asked in the very first um, phone call with the recruiter. And when they ask you questions like, oh, what is your biggest weakness? They're not interested in knowing what your biggest weakness is. Rather, rather what they wanna know is like, you tell them about your weakness. So can you be vulnerable? And are you a kind of person that tries to overcome your weakness? So they, so instead of just stopping at, okay, this is my weakness. Um, that's it. Like you want to, you want to tell them like, okay, I'm, I'm, so I have, so for example, you have ADHD um, and because um, it's difficult to follow conversations. Like I take notes as I go. And personally, actually that's my example because I, I have ADHD and um, I find it difficult to follow conversations. So I, so I try to take notes. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Um, so tell me about a time you had conflict with your coworker. They're going to ask you similar questions along these lines, like how you're able to overcome personal, um, interpersonal challenges. Don't pick, don't paint yourself as a winner every time. What they want to know is, are, are you able to be diplomatic? Um, and are you a humble person, humble person? So if you're, if you picture yourself as a, if you paint yourself as a winner every time, then like they start thinking, okay, so you're never wrong. Um, which means that you're not really a humble person. So these would be some of the more complex um, behavioral questions that they would ask at like fan companies um, or, you know, more later in your career is, you know, tell me about a time, like when you try to simplify a, a process, but failed, like what would you have done differently? Like I would have to think about that for a while. Um, so tell me about a time when you didn't meet customer expectations. And some people get confused about the word customer because as an engineer, we don't really, you know, deal directly with the clients. Um, that's more of like a project managers or a customer success team's job to deal with clients directly. But what they typically mean in this case is um, internal clients. Um, so customer success team typically um, represent um, the clients. So like, how are you able to work with different stakeholders in the team? And you know, um, they had certain expectation, were you able to meet it? If you didn't, what was the problem, right? Tell them about your challenges and how were you, how you were able to overcome it. And if you didn't overcome those problems and you, you, you know, you bombed and you've um, made tons of mistakes, that's good. Like tell them about how you made those, those mistakes and what did you have done differently? And that shows that you're humble and um, you're able to sort of reflect on yourself. So just be honest in your answers and don't try to um, come up with like a bullshit example. And don't be a winner all the time. So that's basically um, what I have for the behavioral questions. And um, I put directly relates to performance here. Mm. Because a person's attitude relates to their attitude in learning. So when you join a new company, you might be, um, you, have, you might have an excellent background in the tech stack that they use, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to learn new things. Actually, you're gonna have to learn new things all the time because uh, there will be domain knowledge that you have to learn about the company. So for example, you join a company that deals with financial data, right? So you're gonna have to learn a little bit of accounting, if you join a company that deals with um, healthcare problems, then you're going to have to um, pick up some domain knowledge that relates to healthcare. So your willingness to learn and yeah, your willingness to learn, it, it kind of directly um, relates to 
how you will perform um, in the future at the company. The STAR method. Um, a STAR method is a method in which you answer, you, yeah, it, it's a way in which you answer and frame your answers, uh, interview questions. Um, so it, the STAR stands for um, situation, task, action, and result. So they're gonna, so they ask you about a behavior, behavioral problem, like what was the situation? So you wanna frame your question, answering, like what was the situation, the task, so, um, what was the requirement? Like you had a, had a conflict um, and then you had a conflict with your coworker. And then in this case, the task would be to resolve that conflict, right? Um, and then action. So the action you took to resolve the problem, result, uh, what are the outcomes? Okay, so question from Twitch. Would you advise a candidate to be more enthusiastic or calm when being interviewed? In my case, I'm, in, I'm pretty enthusiastic. And that's because, I first of all, I wouldn't apply to a company that I'm not interested in. And I try to find out, so one question that I really like to ask is like, what engineering challenge that you currently have in your team? Or like, what's the most um, challenging problem that you solve? It's essentially returning the question that they'd like to ask. Like, what was the most challenging problem that you, saw, uh, that you solved in your previous workplace? You can answer. You can ask that question back and try to find out the, the kind of interesting challenges that they work on, and in the process of knowing what they're working on, like I, in my head, you know, like I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is a way that I can approach that question, and like, and I get interested in um, their problems, and you know, I start to ask a follow-up questions. So it's a like I said, it's a learning process for um, for both parties, and if you communicate, if you ask those questions, it, it speaks enthusiasm to the interviewer. Just ask the right questions. The, um, you know, just ask the right questions and you don't have to appear like enthusiastic, you know, in your body language. Just the fact that you ask those questions um, mean that you're enthusiastic and people like to talk about themselves and what they worked on. So yeah, ask those questions like, oh, what is your biggest challenge? Um, yeah, so that's my answer to this question. Okay, um, doesn't seem like there's anything else. Let's go to the next one. It's so coding challenges. Um, I wanna talk about some high level stuff first. Um, so for this target audience, like interns and, and people looking for first um, full-time jobs, I expect at minimum, you need to know some principles about um, object-oriented design. So for example, like what's the difference between class and object? What is class inheritance? What's the difference between um, static method or um, class method? Um, polymorphism, encapsulation, abstraction, things like that. And um, for a bit more experienced candidates, I would ask about test cases. Um, so how are you able to test your code? Um, and then I would expect the person to give examples of the, some of the like um, testing libraries. So in Python, there's unit tests, um, PyTest. And um, if person knows something what like a CloudWatch is and Sentry is, that's really a big benefit. So Sentry and CloudWatch is a, it's a way to um, report bugs um, in in the, uh, sorry, in the, in the product, um, in the product environment. So, you know, you deploy your project for the clients and, uh, uh, there's a bug that's, um, that happens and, you know, client runs into an error. Um, and these bugs are automatically, um, logged to, um, external services like CloudWatch and Sentry. CloudWatch is, um, Amazon service and Sentry, excuse me. Yeah, um, but I don't. I don't expect you know students to really know or have used these services. And um, some of the most basic data structures like um, list and hash map, people will ask hash map about hash map all the time. Um, and then I would like to talk about how to best prepare for your 
um, coding challenges. So um, I assume a lot of people have heard of lead code already. There is also hacker rank. Um, and I put a link to the curated 75 top lead code questions. Um, this is an article written by a senior Facebook engineer and he has um, essentially collected 75 questions that if you're able to solve these 75 questions without looking at the answer, then you're basically set. You can apply to any fan company or any, any company of that level, um, you should be good to go. And some of these problems, some of the more um, like a hard problems here um, included in, the, in this um, 75 questions, like if you're able to solve it without looking at the answer, like you must be smoking some good stuff because like they're hard. In 45 minutes, if you can come up with the optimal solution, like you have to be pretty smart. Um, and it comes with a lot of, exp um, a lot of practice. Like I've, I've taken the 75 top legal question challenge. Um, I would say I, I can get about half of them without help about the other half. Like I would have to, you know, go look at the answers, take hints. Yeah. Um, and from speaking to my friends who work at like Facebook, um, I fan companies and I've personally interviewed with these companies as well. They don't really go over the medium level equal questions. Um, I've had maybe several um, difficult uh, problems, but also they sometimes ask you questions that they expect that you won't be able to answer. And they sometimes ask questions like that, not because, you know, they want to watch you fail and, and struggle with it, but more to see how you are able to challenge a different difficult problem and how you're able to break down a problem so that you can approach the question in divide and conquer fashion. And they also expect you to answer ask questions. Um, so in real life scenario, when you're out of work, you're gonna be given tasks without um, without clear responsibilities or um, clear definition. So you're gonna to have to like communicate with, you know, project managers or, or other, um, your teammates to find out um, what you need to do. And you're gonna, uh, you're gonna ask for help and provide help all the time. So kind of it, it, it gives them an opportunity to see like how you would actually perform in a real work scenario, solving um, non-trivial problems. Okay. Um, question from Twitch, how can we connect with an interviewer without being a kiss ass? Simple, like I, I think I just told you, like in my case, I'm interested in um, their challenges as much as they're interested in mine. Like ask, just ask them like, what, what is a, um, a task that you recently worked on that was particularly difficult? That's not a kiss ass at all. It, it shows enthusiasm because you're um, trying to learn about their problem. And you might even have like, um, you might even tell them about your approach. I wouldn't really do that because that kind of like comes off as being arrogant because it's an entire team working on a project and like, you know, you come into an interview and tell them what to do. It doesn't really sound that nice. Um, why, another question from Twitch, why do people ask overly simplified obvious questions in some technical interviews? Good question. So uh, I, I included that here, like FizzBuzz, Tusum, um, best time to buy and sell stock. So those are like some of the more basic problems that they ask, especially FizzBuzz. A lot of like people with five years experience on their resume can solve FizzBuzz. And if you don't know what FizzBuzz is, um, it's a very simple um, programming problem where um, you're printing number from like one to hundred. So, um, but at every multiplier of three, so every third number, you are supposed to print fizz and every fifth number you're printing buzz. So it goes like this, you know, you're printing one, two, three, you met the, um, you met three, so you print fizz and four, five, so it's five, it's buzz. Um, it's sort of the twist here, not really a twist is that at every 15, so at 15, um, 15 is a, both a multiplier of three and five. So you're supposed to print out fizz buzz. 
this is an incredibly simple problem, but a lot of people actually can't even answer this question. So if a candidate can solve this, obviously there's no point in um, proceeding any further into the interview. So essentially the reason they ask those is that um, like we don't want to save, we don't want to waste our time and money. Um, so let's see if we can do the most basic problem. My favorite interview experience. Um, one that comes to my mind right now is an interview with Goldman Sachs. And um, he asked this problem, um, which was fairly simple because I, you know, did so many liquid problems. I would, I would put that question in somewhere between like easy to medium. It, it's not trivial, but um, for someone who's done hundreds of questions, like it's pretty easy. And um, I wanted to stand out. So I started solving the problem um, with, um, with recursion. Um, and I ran into like a couple bugs, obviously. Um, I was being overly confident. And we sort of like started debugging together. And somehow like it really led to um, more like a pair programming experience rather than just um, the interviewers just like looking at my code. And so that would, you know, after that, he, we did like a couple other questions as well to, since I solved like the easy problem, there was like another like medium, like harder uh, level problems. And the rest of the interview just went like a pair of programming. So it felt very much like a real work scenario. And I think he, uh, I think the interviewer took that as very positive sign. And um, yeah, like I really enjoyed that specific interview. Favorite interview question, I can't really say. Um, I don't know if that this person is asking about, um, you know, be like a coding challenge or behavioral type question. Um, can't really answer that question without being more specific. Um, another question from the chat. Um, so as a student with no real work experience with the company, pretty much starting off new, what can I do to make my resume LinkedIn profile more attractive to increase chances of getting an interview? <laughs> I think the, the way to actually stand out among your peers um, with, for someone who's had no professional experience, make your resume short and don't use flowery words. Avoid um, floating adjectives because people because um, first and second year students, because they didn't really have valuable experience, they feel like they have to stretch their sentences um, by adding, it's like when you're given a you know, five page essay in high school and like people just try to add more words, unnecessary words to meet the, the page guide, um, meet the five page rule or, or the num to meet the number of like a thousand words um, do, do that on your resume, then you will actually stand out because your resume looks clean. Yeah, so that's my answer to that question. Um, so a common interview, intro level interview questions, I already talked about it. Answer strategies. So when an interviewer asks you, uh, um, you know, they give you a coding challenge, always spend the first few minutes to clarify the requirements. So what are the input constraints? Um, do I need to validate inputs? Um, is the input going to fit in memory? Because depending on the size of the input, maybe you're not allowed to, you can't, it goes, it exceeds the uh, memory amount. And then you have to tackle that problem differently. Um, or can you have negative numbers, just sim simple things like that, right? Um, at a more complex level, like if you're given a graph problem, is there a cycle in the graph? If you don't understand this um, because you didn't learn about um, graph traversals and stuff like that, don't worry about it. You will learn um, in school, probably in second year and more in depth than fourth year. Um, another thing that I want to mention is there are optimized way of solving problems and then there is a naive way. Once you get to more medium and high level, um, hard level questions, 
most of these questions can be solved in a naive way, but uh, the time complexity um, is way over the optimal solution. So, you know, the optimal solution may be n, O of n, uh, but the naive way could be like O of n um, cube. Um, so, this is my um, this is my point of view. So, it's much better to have a working naive solution than spending sixty minutes trying to come up with um, optimal bug-free code. And you know, you write the code in thirty minutes, and then the rest of the interview, you're just like trying to debug errors, you know, it's not fun for the interviewer. They're just, you know, sitting there and watching. They might try to guide to um, debug it, but without a debugger, um, it's just a lot of hassle. It's, it's a lot of work that you have to do. And, you know, you're going to have to use print statements, stuff that you really won't, um, you don't want to do in, in your uh, real work life scenario. And uh, yeah, another thing that I want to mention is, you know, you're allowed to ask for hints. It's not a bad thing. And it's actually a benefit to you because it um, shows that you're able to ask help, especially for, you know, university students. You're going to need help all the time when you join a new company. And you're running out of time, you know, you're 50 minutes in and in a one hour interview, um, tell them like, how you would approach the rest of the problem instead of just ending it there. And yeah, data structures and algorithms. So again, like if you haven't learned those uh, material yet, don't worry about it. Um, more importantly, I want to talk about stuff that you don't really need to memorize or worry about. You don't need to, nobody is going to ask you to implement like a quick sort or merge sort. It's important to know what these are and the runtime complexities and memories and stuff like that. But I've never been asked in my hundreds of interviews uh, to implement a sorting algorithm. They're going to ask you questions that leverages sorting. But yeah, um, you will just import a library or built-in function. Um, that's it. Okay, so another resume question. I will follow through with these later on um, because I'm getting a lot of resume questions. So yeah, I talked about sorting algorithms. Um, and also you will need to, you're not gonna be asked to um, implement common data structures. Like they're not gonna ask you to implement um, queue or stack. Rather, they're going to ask you questions that you will need those data structures. So don't try too much time, you know, trying to implement those. Um, yeah, so you might be asked, asked to implement like a linked list, but I don't know. I've, I've never been asked that. Um, so if you're already familiar with like hash map, queue, stack, and linked list, um, Binary trees are also pretty important. Um, heaps. So, sorry, um, and set. Um, set is pretty similar to like hash map. You know, it um, the runtime complexity for finding an element in it is O of one, um, which is the same thing as hash map. Um, and those are some of the the divide and conquer greedy algorithms, dynamic, dynamic programming. So those are like different types of um, algorithm problems. Um, I would say you probably want to focus some time on like divide and conquer and greedy algorithms. Dynamic programming, this is really hard. Um, yeah, so you could, so for example, like my friend um, who recently got a job at Amazon, he didn't even study any dynamic programming um, problems. He was like, okay, if I get a dynamic programming problem, like I'm not getting the job. So yeah. Oh, let's move on. It's currently eight. Sorry. Yeah. So honestly, that's about it. Um, system design. We don't really need to get into this. This is for more like upper level, um, like an intermediate senior, um, 
you know, viewers. That, um, so that's um, answered some of the questions. Sorry, guys, I already took an hour. Questions? Okay. Oh, you guys want to do a live resume critique? Yeah, if you graduate without a co-op, that's fine. Like there's tons of, most students don't have co-op experience. 100% fine, but make sure you have something on your resume, like do personal projects, like build a website or something like that, which is exactly what I did. I had no co-op experience in CS graduating. So I actually spent about six months building my own portfolio. What do you do if you're asked a question you don't know answer to? So this depends on the type of question. Are we talking about talking about behavioral question or a coding challenge? If it's a coding challenge, well, if an interview, so you're you're sitting there and struggling even to like um, start how to answer the question, then interviewer will give you hints, or rather, you should ask for hints because they don't want to sit there and watch you just right i don't know like they, just, they don't want to watch you just not doing anything right so and it is expected of the interviewers to provide you with hints um and it's an important metric on how to how they measure um your ability to work in in at a workplace because you are going to need help you are going to need to coach other people further into your um career so ask for hints that's that's my suggestion Okay, if there's no other question, then I can sort of just do a live uh, resume critique. Okay. Um, Polina, would you provide me with just uh, any, like a random link to a, a resume? Do we still have people here? Sorry, I closed the chat accidentally. Okay, yeah, let's do Jeff Bezos. So, yeah, we had an opportunity to look at Jeff Bezos' resume before actually this uh, presentation began. Some of the comments I had, um, so here, the project was created with a team of 14 using JavaScript. It's not important to say team of 14. Say, you know, you worked in a team of 10, a team of 20, like, does it really matter? From a recruiter's point of view, like the team size doesn't really, it doesn't add much value, right? project was created with a team of 14 using JavaScript, TypeScript, Google Firebase in Linux environment. Um, several other technologies. If you're not going to be specific about what those technologies are, don't mention it. MuseBase is a full stack social media platform that connects users to others. What others, right? So connects to users, I think this, this is perfectly sufficient because, I mean, that, that's what uh, social media platform does it connects to users to other users 
with similar musical taste using Spotify. The project includes software design documents such as analysis and project management plans. I think this is a little bit uh, verbose and repetitive. If you say software design documents, actually, I think this is enough. Like you say the project includes software design and documents because these would be the subset of software design documents, right? And then really the time to talk about um, these more specific details is during the resume because they will deep dive into specific bullet points and you will get to give all as much detail as you want. So there's no to, there's no need to like put every little detail um, on a resume and you know, some of you may be pressured to um, do this because otherwise your resume seems too short, but shorter resume would actually stand out because everybody else is doing the same thing. Um, create an online note taking app called inscription. I think it's, you can remove the word inscription without losing value. Create a note, created a note taking app, right? The name doesn't really matter too much in this case with a live database, the word live here, right? Does it really matter? I mean, if it's not, by default, the database would be live. So like, what's the opposite of live, you know, dead? Would, why would you use a dead database? So the, what I'm trying to say is, is that like a live is obvious, like it doesn't really add value here again. Um, authentication and embedded video. I think that's enough with three friends. Again, <laughs> with three friends. <laughs> I don't know why this is important. <laughs> I, I kind of find it funny um, to say that you did it, right? Um, and that is sufficient. Like you can talk about how, you know, maybe the person, this Jeff Bezos is trying to say it, like, look, we created this product in a very small team under like few number of hours, that's fine. Again, like you can talk about that in a, a during the interview. Um, but really, the fact that you work with three friends doesn't matter. You could have said five or one; it wouldn't mean anything differently to um, the interviewer. The app uses Google Firebase for notes to be saved to the cloud. Like this is just way too much. So Google authentication for account creation. Um, I think you can just say authentication services and that is more, it's more of a broad term and which is a good thing because now like they will ask you like, look, this is not specific enough. Maybe can you tell me like what kind of authentication technologies you used? And it's perfectly fine to be more broad. Um, and I, I talk about specificity all the time. So maybe, you know, this sounds confusing to you, but in this case, it wouldn't lose value to say authentication services because it's commonly understood. Um, it, it, it means something like, um, you know, two-factor authentication, right? Um, we used React, React con Context. Um, that's good. I think that's enough for this uh, resume. Sorry, I'm trying to open the chat. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know, any other questions? Ask me anything. If you think your question is dumb, that's fine. There's another resume in the chat if you wanna go through that one. Okay. I don't know why this keeps doing this.
Sorry, Polina. So this um, link goes to the shared folder, not a specific resume. Oh yeah, um, choose the one that says blocked out resume in the folder. Excuse me. Is it there? Sorry, is it this one? Um, it's called block out, blocked out resume. You'd have to go in the shared folder. Just click the link and then, yeah. Because some of them are being uploaded right now. There we go. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't like the formatting of this. So people read left, right, top to bottom. And this, so this reads like left to right and then left to right again. It's a nitpicking. Um, really at the end of the day, this is not gonna affect whether you get the interview or not, most likely. But yeah, I don't like the formatting. I, I think you should just aim for the simplest formatting possible. Um, I shared like my friend's resume um, just make it as simple as possible, right? Don't use colors because it, um, they're going to print. So maybe like today, you know, we work remotely most of the time, but um, like people print resumes all the time and, you know, people use like black and uh, black and white, um, you know, that saves money. So like once, once you have print this, like most of the color details are going to disappear and like some people are colorblind and all that. So just try to use the simplest format possible. Like don't use colors. You can use bold or um, like larger fonts. And I think that's enough. Uh, skills, detail oriented, creative thinking. This is what I mean by floating adjectives. So am I supposed to believe that this person is detail oriented because you know they included in a resume under skill section? Like the opportunity to talk about um, those more like a soft skills is during the interview and it will become obvious in how you frame your answers. Creative thinking again, like if you can answer their questions in a creative way that, that displays that you have, you know, you're creative, like they cannot make judgment on your skills based on what you write. Um, another example of, some like this, you, you know, some people put like, um, you know, excellent leadership skills, things like that. Like, am I supposed to believe that you have excellent um, leadership skills because you said it and put it in your resume? No. Communication and other stuff, um, data analyzation. Like, let's just remove, I would remove everything here. Ex I was going to say except, but actually just, I would remove everything here. Yeah. Um, the Eclipse case competition secured first place among 20 other teams in Ontario wide case competition. So I don't think you need to say Ont Ontario wide case competition. It doesn't really add value. If you just, if you say that you um, secured first place in this Eclipse case competition, then that's enough hosted by University of um, Toronto. Okay. Another thing, um, like as an interviewer, like am I supposed to know what this competition is? Like, and what kind of competition is it exactly? What are they trying to test you on, right? Is it a like some kind of coding challenge or um, coding competition? I don't know what it is. Um, so be more specific, like this whole thing as it is, I would just remove it. So I don't know what this person is talking about. Business and economics, residence case competition. Okay, so this is good. Like now I know what this competition about is about. Secured second place among eight other teams within our business and economics residence. Okay, um, so I'll just jump on to the work history. Assisted residents with financial and academic mental goals. Hmm. 
what is a mental goal? Yeah, I would remove that. Yeah, I don't know. Develop team communication and information for meetings. I have no idea what that means. Um, team com team commun like how do you develop team communications? Right, you foster communications by starting conversations, and that's what you should write. Like the wording "developed team communication" like doesn't make any sense. De so the second part, develop so it goes like this: developed information for meetings. That's just bad writing. Um, so when I make those criticisms, like I'm not trying to roast you. It's just, it's honestly just how I feel. And I, I help my friends all the time with resume writing. And like, this is just how I approach it. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that don't take my criticism personally. Um, it is what it is. And those are the areas that you can improve on. Um, another formatting that I'm kind of, if Eon is like the work history and then you have this like colored space, I don't know why that's there. It, it's just unnecessary. Uh, monitor deliveries by checking merchandise against invoice. Okay, that's, I think that's, um, That, that that wording has no verbosity or like you're not repeating anything. So I think that that's pretty good. Invoice paperwork, although is not, right? Invoice is a paperwork. So you don't need to say invoice paperwork and notify supervisor of discrepancies. Um, I think you should reword it like this. Monitored and noted discrepancies of deliveries by checking against the invoice. I think I think that we are good to pretty much like stop at this point for this resume. Um, yeah, I'd like to answer more questions if you guys have any, have any of them. Otherwise, I think this is it. Sounds good. So that'll wrap, wrap up today's conversation, oh, sorry, event and Q&A session. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining today. I know it's right after St. Paddy's Day. Um, and, and a huge thank you to John for taking the time to create this awesome presentation and taking the time to also do a resume critique for a bunch of students. Um, if you've submitted your resume before, uh, John is happy to reach out to you over email or you can always contact him. John, feel free to include your contact info whenever. And make sure to join LCS's next event um, on Wednesday. It's going to be a LinkedIn workshop. If you want to register, the link is in the Laurier CS um, Insta. Make sure that you register there. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you, everyone. And thanks, Polina and the team for um, help setting this up. Goodbye.